Last Stands have always had a way of capturing the imagination, with tales of incredible feats of heroism and self-sacrifice, where men are faced with impossible odds, yet still refuse to give up despite certain death. Yet while famous Last Stands such as those at Thermopylae the Alamo and Rourke's Drift are all well known in the English-speaking world, history is littered with countless other examples of incredible Last Stands that are lesser known but no less amazing. Number 5. The Siege of Sigetvar in 1566, a small group of less than 3,000 Hungarian and Croatian soldiers held off a besieging Ottoman army over 100,000 men strong, enduring waves of overwhelming attacks of elite enemy soldiers and relentless bombardments from terrifyingly powerful weapons, refusing to surrender at every step of the way. By the time the siege was over, the leaders of both armies would be dead, along with nearly all of the 3,000 defenders and as many as 20,000 Ottomans, in a bitter clash that was later referred to as the battle that saved civilization. Although the Ottomans had been victorious, the cost had been high, and the last stand of the 3,000 is considered by many to have been responsible for postponing an Ottoman attack on Vienna, and thus saving Europe from Ottoman domination. The 16th century had been a time of near constant war between the Ottoman Empire and Habsburg dynasty, with both sides holding claims over the contested Kingdom of Hungary. Under the brilliant stewardship of the famous Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, the Ottoman Empire had grown massively in size and was expanding its reach deep into Europe. This expansion had spread great fear amongst the European powers, who were keen to prevent any further Ottoman encroachment into Christendom. Yet aged 72, Sultan Suleiman once again set out to war, leading one of the largest armies ever assembled on a campaign to take the Habsburg capital of Vienna, an expedition that would prove to be his last. Sultan Suleiman's plan had been to capture the city of Ego on his way to Vienna, however news reached his ear of a troublesome Croatian nobleman who had been leading attacks on the Ottoman supply trains. Count Nikola Zarinsky was a wealthy landowner and seasoned soldier who operated out of his small fortress at Sigetvar, yet the 3,000 men he commanded were seen as no match for the Sultan's great army, and so the decision was made to first deal with this minor annoyance before continuing the march on Vienna. The Sultan surrounded Zarinsky and his 3,000 defenders at the fortress of Sigetvar, expecting to easily remove this thorn from his side, yet despite being surrounded on all sides by an overwhelming force of at least 100,000 men, Zarinsky refused Ottoman demands for his surrender, even though he was outnumbered by as much as 50 to 1, and must have known that there was no chance for victory. On August the 6th, the battle began, as Suleiman ordered his men to attack. Waves of Ottoman soldiers advanced on the fortress, only to be thrown back again and again by the defiant defenders, suffering heavy casualties with each failed assault. The layout of the fortress made breaking through difficult, with each section of the town divided by water, which was accessible only via narrow bridges, which made excellent choke points. Large-scale attacks consisting of tens of thousands of Ottoman foot soldiers were repeatedly sent against the defenders over the course of a bloody month of fighting, however each time the attacks were repulsed. Yet with each victory, the defenders found their numbers dwindling, as more and more of them were cut down in the desperate fighting. As the siege began to draw to its inevitable end, the last few surviving defenders retreated into the old town under heavy cannon fire and prepared to make the final stand. The Sultan had been both enraged and impressed by the defiance and bravery of Zarinsky and his men, even going so far as to offer the nobleman leadership of Croatia in exchange for his surrender, but the stubborn Count sent no reply and continued to fight on. With the fortress walls reduced to rubble and much of the town aflame, the final all-out attack was planned. However, just as victory seemed certain, Suleiman died of natural causes in his tent, his passing was kept secret from the army for fear that they might give up the battle upon finding out the Sultan was dead, and even his personal physician was said to have been strangled so as to keep the secret. Despite the Sultan's death, commanders began the final attack, however Zarinsky still had some surprises up his sleeve. As the Ottoman army poured into the city, the defenders opened fire with a large hidden mortar which had been loaded with broken iron, killing 600 attackers squashed together as they crossed a narrow bridge. Zrinsky then lit a burning fuse connected to 3,000 pounds of gunpowder which was stored under the fortress and led the remaining survivors on one last charge into the enemy where he was cut down in a hail of arrows and bullets. The Ottomans dispatched the last defenders and perhaps just as they began to celebrate the long-awaited victory, relieved that the siege was finally over, 
they received Zurinsky's parting gift as the gunpowder magazine exploded, killing another 3,000 Ottoman soldiers inside the fortress. Almost all of Zurinsky's garrison had been wiped out, yet the siege had cost the Ottomans nearly 30,000 soldiers, crippling the Sultan's army and perhaps forcing him to abandon the planned push towards Vienna. Thanks to Zrinsky's incredible last stand, Vienna had been saved, and it would be over a century before the Ottomans would threaten Central Europe again. Number 4. The Last Stand of the Swiss Guard In 1527, the ancient city of Rome was captured and plundered by a leaderless band of rampaging mercenaries, the Eternal City's population seemingly forsaken by God, as they were subjected to a ten-month-long campaign of violence and humiliation at the hands of their new overlords that would see 10,000 murdered in the orgy of violence. Yet, despite such calamity, the Pope managed to escape the mob's clutches thanks to the heroic last stand of the Swiss Guard, the tiny band of 189 bodyguards holding off the 24,000-strong horde just long enough for the Pope to make his final escape in a rearguard action that nearly saw them completely wiped out. At the time, Europe was roughly split into two camps, those loyal to the Habsburg-led Holy Roman Empire and those who wished to rein in the Emperor's power, led by France and the Pope. The Pope wished to free himself from domination by the Holy Roman Empire and so had aligned himself with France, However, when the French army in Italy was defeated by imperial troops, Rome itself lay vulnerable. The men of the Emperor's army had for too long gone unpaid, and were growing increasingly mutinous. Riled up by Protestant elements in the army, who viewed Rome as a valid target for religious reasons, and further encouraged by men whose main concern was plunder, the commander was forced to march on Rome, which was known to be rich in loot, the army growing in size along the way, as bandits and opportunists saw a chance to enrich themselves beyond belief. Rome had been left dangerously undefended, with just 5,000 militiamen and 189 Swiss guard manning its walls. After all, who would risk eternal damnation by striking at the heart of Christendom? Such a small and unprepared force proved no match for the Emperor's forces, and despite a brave resistance, the city quickly fell. However, the Imperial Army's commander was killed in the assault. The leaderless army entered the city, and now lacking any respected commanders, all semblance of restraint and order melted away as the wild men began pillaging Rome's numerous treasures. Churches and palaces were stripped of their wealth while thousands of citizens were robbed and slaughtered, as men who had previously suffered at the hands of the Pope's armies unleashed their bloody revenge. Murder and plunder was in the air, yet perhaps the greatest prize still remained at large, the Pope himself. Upwards of 20,000 men descended upon the Vatican, however realising that the Pope's life was in danger, 189 Swiss guards stood in their way, the men forming a defensive line on the steps of St. Peter's Basilica in an effort to block the murderous mob from capturing the Pope, who was in the process of fleeing to safety. The two forces met in a bloody melee, however despite standing their ground and fighting bravely, the 189 elite guardsmen were overwhelmed by the massive numbers of their foe, and the majority of them were hacked to pieces. Around 40 injured guards managed to withdraw with their lives, and fought a desperate delaying action across the escape bridge, fending off the frenzied attacks of the Imperial troops, as the Pope made his way to the safety of a nearby castle. Despite suffering horrendous casualties, the men had spent their blood in a last stand that bought the Pope just enough time to escape, the small band of bloodied and bruised survivors joining him in the nearby fort, where they hoped to wait out the sacking of their beloved city. For ten months, the plunder and terror would continue, during which even the graves of saints would be looted, before the Pope was eventually forced to sign a humiliating peace treaty that ceded land to the Holy Roman Empire and greatly damaged his prestige. Yet, thanks to the sacrifice of the Swiss guards, he had survived the sacking of Rome with his life, the heroic last stand still recognised to this day, with all new recruits being sworn in on May the 6th each year, the same date that the guards demonstrated their bravery so many centuries ago. Number 3. Seito Benkei In 1189, the life of a near mythical Japanese warrior monk came to an end while single-handedly defending a bridge against 500 samurai who had been sent to apprehend his master. The six-foot-five man-mountain of a warrior is said to have slaughtered 300 men before finally being impaled by a storm of hundreds of arrows, the unusual manner of his death becoming just as legendary as his extraordinary life, and known as the Standing Death of Benkei, 
his loyalty and honour until the bitter end, earning him a permanent place in Japanese folklore. Benkei's origins are shrouded in mystery, however he's thought to have been born into humble origins. From an early age he proved to be unusual, growing much larger than the other boys his age, and becoming so unruly that people began calling him the devil's child. Frustrated by his behaviour, his parents sent him to a monastery, hoping that life with the monks might tame him. However, he continued to find himself drawn to trouble, until age 17 he left the monasteries to become a wandering bandit monk. By now he was far taller than average at a height of 6 feet 5, and his time spent with the warrior monks had left him extremely competent in armed combat and endowed him with great strength, skills he intended to put to use, and he is said to have defeated 200 men in various battles he had participated in using the seven different weapons he carried with him at all times, to ruthlessly dispatch his foes. Disdainful of what he saw as unworthy, arrogant samurai, he posted himself at a bridge in Kyoto, where he would challenge any samurai attempting to pass, to either pay a toll or fight him in a duel. By doing so he is said to have defeated 999 samurai, collecting their swords as prizes, however one evening while waiting for sword number 1000, he encountered a young man of small stature who accepted his challenge. The fight seemed like an unfair mismatch, however seemingly against the odds the young challenger easily disarmed and defeated the strong but slow Benkei with a far superior fighting technique. Believing that he had finally met a man worthy of the title of samurai, Benkei became his loyal retainer, the young challenger none other than Yoshitsune, the man who would go on to establish himself as one of the greatest warriors of the era and candidate for one of the most famous samurai in Japanese history. The pair went on to fight in the Genpai War, their efforts contributing to victory and earning Yoshitsune awards and titles from the Emperor, however his elder brother would grow envious of his success and betrayed him, having Yoshitsune declared an outlaw. Between 1185 and 1189, Benkei stayed loyal to his master, joining him in the life of an outlaw as they hid from the soldiers who hunted them, while performing deeds that have become the embodiment of idealism and loyalty, however the pair could not outrun their fate forever. They were eventually encircled by 500 samurai at a castle in northern Japan, and realising that there was no hope of escape, began making preparations for their last stand. Yoshitsune retreated to the inner keep, where he planned to commit ritual suicide, while Benkei positioned himself on the bridge in front of the main gate, blocking the attacking soldiers' access to the castle, in a bid to buy his master enough time to take his own life. Just as he had done at the bridge in Kyoto all those years ago, Benkei challenged the enemy soldiers to face him in battle. 300 samurai are said to have met their end at the blade of the imposing man, before the remainder realised that fighting him up close and personal was a near suicidal proposition. The 200 men remaining decided to dispatch Benkei from a safe distance, and so fired volleys of arrows at him from across the bridge, dozens of which found their mark and impaled the man where he stood. Yet, amazingly, despite the horrendous wounds he suffered from the dozens of arrows piercing his body, Benkei appeared to still be standing, weapon in hand. For a while, nobody dared approach the invincible man, however eventually the samurai cautiously moved forward, discovering that the man had somehow died on his feet, perhaps held in an upright position by the arrows somehow, his bizarre death written into legend as the standing death of Benkei. The grizzled warrior's lone last stand on the bridge had bought his master the time he needed to end his life according to tradition, his sacrifice becoming the epitome of loyalty, honour and duty and widely viewed as the ideal way for a samurai to die. Number 2. The Saxon House Carls at Hastings The year 1066 was a time of great change and turmoil for England, a year that would see the reigning king fall in battle after taking an arrow to the eye and an invading force of Normans conquer the country. However, the battles fought that year were not only remarkable because of the impact they had on history, but also as being the site of two legendary last stands that perfectly encapsulated the code of honour the warriors fighting the battles adhere to, their deeds echoing through the ages, long after the men who fought them had passed. In January of 1066, the King of England died without an heir, leading to a succession crisis as several powerful men claimed the throne. Harold Godwinson was crowned king, however he had to quickly mobilise his troops to fend off threats from two powerful rivals. The first threat came from the King of Norway, Harold Hardrada, the pair meeting in battle at Stamford Bridge to test which side was worthy of the crown. 
It was during this battle that the first of two incredible last stands to take place in 1066 occurred. As the English forces rushed forward towards the Viking lines, the only route via a small wooden bridge that crossed the river. In front of them loomed a lone, unnamed berserker warrior who defiantly blocked the bridge in a bid to delay the English advance and allow the Viking forces more time to organize. According to chroniclers of the battle, the lone berserker single-handedly halted the English advance, slaying any who dared approach him, before eventually being killed after an English house call swam under the bridge and speared him in the groin from below. The berserker's stand was ended, however not before his great axe had claimed the lives of over 40 English warriors, yet his sacrifice proved to be in vain, as the English poured over the bridge and defeated the Viking army, killing Harold Hardrada in the process. Duke William of Normandy now remained the English king's last opponent, and after hearing that the Normans had just crossed the channel from France, the king rushed his battle-weary men south to meet them and decide who would rule England once and for all. The two forces clashed at the small village of battle which has been named after the historic fight, and despite King Harold holding the high ground, which was the perfect defensive position for his infantry, the eager warriors were lured out of formation and charged down the hill when Duke William's forces pretended to flee in panic. The retreat was a brilliant trick, and the Normans turned around and attacked the now vulnerable English infantry. In the ensuing chaos of battle, King Harold was shot through the eye with an arrow and killed, yet despite the majority of his army quickly routing, his loyal house calls, the backbone of his army and elite bodyguards who were sworn to protect him, maintained their oath and closed ranks around their dead king's body, where they fought to the death, the men surrounded by the victorious Normans, and cut down where they stood, falling on the same bloody patch of grass where their dead king lay. Number 1. The Battle of Saragari On the 12th of September 1897, a small force of 21 Sikhs of the British Indian Army fought to the death against a horde of 10,000 Afghan tribesmen in a defensive battle that's often viewed as one of the greatest last stands in history and has been compared to the Spartans' last stand at Thermopylae due to the enormous odds stacked against them. Facing certain death, the men unanimously agreed to defend the remote outpost they were manning rather than retreat or surrender, yet they would not sell their lives cheaply. By the time the battle was over, as many as 600 Afghans would lay dead around the ruined outpost, the tribesmen made to pay a bloody price for their victory by the bullets and bayonets of the 21 Sikhs. The volatile area known as the Northwest Frontier Province had always proved troublesome for the British to maintain control over, with rebellions, attacks and raids by tribesmen a common occurrence. In an effort to maintain order in the region, five companies of the 36th Sikh Regiment had been sent to man a series of forts in the area which had been designed to provide a solid defence against any incursions while quelling any potential uprisings. Yet two of these forts were out of each other's line of sight due to the rocky landscape and so a small communications post had been constructed at Saragari to enable the two forts to relay messages back and forth. The outpost itself was little more than a small block house with a signalling tower that had been built on top of a rocky ridge, yet it was crucial for the survival of the two forts it served, and therefore for the defence of the entire region. If the outpost fell, the two forts would be isolated and unable to communicate with each other, making picking them off one by one far easier. Yet despite the outpost's importance, the Afghan uprising of 1897 had led to the army being stretched thin and just 21 soldiers of the 36th Sikh Regiment could be spared to defend it. Life for the 21 men at the remote outpost might have ordinarily been dull and uneventful, the day taken up with monotonous duties in the baking sun. However, on the morning of the 12th of September 1897, a storm was coming, one that would cost them their lives but write their names in the history books. At 9am while conducting his usual observations, the detachment commander, Sergeant Ishar Singh, saw an approaching horde of 10,000 Afghans, the tribesmen rapidly closing in on the outpost, intending to destroy it and thus cut off communications between the two forts it served. An urgent request for reinforcements was sent to nearby Fort Lockhart, however no help was coming. Outnumbered nearly 500 to 1, the 21 men knew they stood no chance against the enemy and at this point could have attempted to retreat or surrender. However, after holding a brief meeting, they unanimously agreed to stand their ground and fight to the last man, 
knowing that doing so might buy the men in the nearby forts valuable time to reinforce and prepare for the coming onslaught. Like the Spartans at Thermopylae, the Sikhs knew that they could use the narrow approaches to the outpost to their advantage, as the enemy would be prevented from deploying their full force at one time, instead having to attack through narrow choke points in several smaller groups. Wave after wave of Afghans were cut down as they crashed against the Sikh lines, each time failing to break through the outer wall. However, with each new attack, the Sikhs' ammunition and strength was dwindling, each wave inflicting more irreplaceable casualties on the already tiny group of soldiers, while the detailed events of the unfolding battle were broadcast back to the men in the nearby fort in real time. By 2pm the Sikhs were down to just 10 men, and virtually out of ammunition, yet they still fought on. Shocked by the stiff resistance they were encountering, the Afghan leaders promised the remaining men safe passage if they would just surrender, yet such offers were flatly refused. Desperate to end the battle, the Afghans set fire to the bushes around the outpost, using the resulting smoke cloud as cover to break through the wall. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting ensued, as the remaining Sikhs battled the tribesmen with bayonets and bare hands, with the Sikhs leader Sergeant Ishar Singh ordering his men to fall back to the inner wall, the badly injured man remaining behind where he sacrificed his life leading a bayonet charge to buy his men precious minutes to fall back. Yet, the onslaught could not be stopped, and after broadcasting his last message back to the fort, the last Sikh remaining alive entered the fray, the lone man reportedly taking down 20 Afghans before being overwhelmed and killed. With Saragari destroyed, the nearby fort was the next target, however the 21 Sikhs had delayed the Afghans long enough for reinforcements to arrive. The fort had been saved. When a relief column eventually recaptured Saragari, the burnt bodies of the 21 Sikh soldiers were found, surrounded by the corpses of 600 tribesmen. The 21 men who had fought to the death were posthumously awarded the Indian Order of Merit, which was the highest gallantry award of that time, with the events of the incredible battle still celebrated to this day, on the 12th of September every year, the names and deeds of the remarkable men who sacrificed their lives that day becoming legend. So those are my choices for 5 incredible but lesser known last stands. Let me know your thoughts and which lesser known last stands you would have included in the list in the comments below, and I hope to see you again soon.